Okay, welcome everybody to a very special podcast uh, for the Mahogany Dot uh, Mahogany Thoughts podcast. I'm Dr. Terrence Duncan. I'm with my co-host uh, Charletta Taylor and Terrence Butler. How, uh, Charletta? How are you doing? I am doing well. How are you doing? Doing peaceful. I'm doing peaceful. Just um, still riding a wave during the pandemic. Uh, Terrence, what's going on with you? Terrence, Butler, it's like we're having some technical difficulties. So we're actually going to do something a little bit different um, this time. Normally, we've been recording our podcast through um, regular conventional means, um, but we actually decided to go ahead and have a panel discussion. And on this panel discussion, we have six mental health specialists um, ranging from family therapy, from children therapy, couples therapy. Um, each of them have a unique background, a unique story, and we're going to go around the room briefly, and we're going to start off. Um, also, we're actually trying to broadcast this on Facebook Live. So uh, we have uh, nine screens running at the same time, so you might hear a little background noise from time to time, but, you know, we're going to still make this a dope product. So uh, we're going to start off. Uh, i got my frat brother, Toya White in the building. Um, Mr. White, go ahead and introduce yourself. Uh, what's your area of specialty um, and experience and a brief little background story about how did you get there? Good, everybody. Uh, I'm Toya White, founder of the Toya R. White brand, LLC. With my, my therapy practice is Toya White. I'm also doing some uh, corporate training uh, and speaking. My therapy practice is focused uh, while I have a, a myriad of different clients, my focus is uh, on men and boys in the front black and brown spaces. I have an internet radio show on 881thetruth.com, which airs Wednesdays uh, at 7 a.m. and uh, 6.30 p.m. Central Time. And I uh, also have an online mental wellness t-shirt and apparel store called Therapies LLC, um, which is where I started this line. Um, and so that website is shoptherapies.com how I got here, right? So I grew up, I'm from the West Side, St. Louis, St. Louis Avenue, um, uh, St. Louis Avenue and Clara. And I was a, uh, a voluntary desegregation student. And uh, I found myself in a situation where I was not able to receive uh, culturally relevant uh, counseling services, uh, you know, even in the, in the school counseling realm. So what I wanted to do was uh, just become the um, repair of the breach. Uh, I received that message some time ago. So this is purpose-driven work for me. So I, um, I'm, I'm the repair of the breach, man. I want to bridge the gap between men and boys in and from black and brown spaces and um, individual community and uh, social wellness. Sounds good. Sounds good, man. I appreciate it stuff, man, from uh, jumping on the show and um, being able to drop your knowledge, you know, not only for just today, May the 9th, but also uh, the second panel discussion that we'll have on May the 16th on Facebook, as well as a uh, actual recording. Um, also, to my right, we have uh, Tessie Amos, uh, Q Sci Fi. What's going on? What's going on, my brother, my sisters? How you doing? You got it. Um, again, I'm honored and pleased to be here. Uh, uh, like Dr. Duncan said, I'm Tessie Amos III, uh, uh, co co owner of this Two Shall Pass Life Consulting Firm. Uh, we specialize in uh, adolescents, couples, family, uh, trauma, grief. Uh, my goal and my mission for doing this type of work for being a therapist is to just see my people in a much happier space to just be much happier. Um, I've witnessed, I bear witness over the last 20 plus years of being a social servant, um, too many families that just simply break up for very, very petty reasons. And so I just thought maybe I could get in there, maybe I could jump in the pool and do something and keep some of these families together, keep some of this love going. I could help people uh, get over loss and grief. Uh, and I could also help people recover from trauma. We have trauma has become something that appears to be normal in our everyday lives. Trauma has definitely something with our adolescents that they just see as a normal way of life and they don't know how it's affecting them. So I want to provide psychoeducation when it comes to that. And again, this is my ministry. So uh, this is what I do unto my savior. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely, man. Thank you for joining. Um, we're going to also, we're going to drop down a box and we're going to go to Miss Tyler Roy, good friend of mine. I've known for 15, I think 15 years, uh, something like that, 89 blocks, because she jumped on my head and stuff because uh, I said the wrong school earlier, but 
Um, Representative from Lincoln, Eastside Lincoln, um, Tyler Roy. Terrence, stop it, Terrence. <laughs> Okay, um, my name is Tyler Roy. Um, I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. Uh, I ended up here, I'm a full-time provider for Southern Illinois Healthcare. So I'm a full-time provider on the behavioral health unit there. I've been in private practice going on 12 years now where I practice in Swansea. Um, my areas of specialty are women's issues, adolescent issues, um, post-trauma issues, grief loss, uh, and loss and separation issues, um, anything related to any kind of victimization. In addition to LCPC, I'm a, a, let me get this right, certified clinical trauma professional and a licensed sex offender treatment provider. Um, how did I end up here? I ended up here, I spent nine years as a parole, probation and parole officer for the state of Missouri. During that time, um, reality therapy and cognitive restructuring was huge in terms of how do you get people to change their behaviors, you get them to changing their cognitive processes associated with the behaviors. So I became interested then. At the time that I was leaving um, probation and parole, I had, during my exit interview, I had somebody ask me, you know, I've been in this field for 37 years, Tyler. I've never seen, you know, grown men, grown women crying because they were lo losing their parole officer. Mm -hmm. And so what I got them to understand was that, so they wanted to know, what is it that you do that nobody else does that, you know, parolees and probationers don't want to lose their probation officer? And I said to them at that time, I've approached this job from day one. Like, I understand fully that there, I'm only one decision away from being on the other side of that table. So I treated all of my clients and offenders the exact same way. I know that that could have been me on the other side of the table. So I realized that it was my passion for cognitive restructuring, for understanding and trying to change the concept of how people think that was going to be kind of monumental in getting behaviors to change. So I'm very passionate about what I do. Um, I have a, a special... Um, love for adolescent work, um, but I do focus a lot on women's issues too. Well, thank you for joining the show and thank you for joining the panel and definitely have a lot of experience. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Just love to have your experience on here. So um, definitely appreciate it. Next we have uh, slotted to the left. We have Carmel Brown. How are you doing, Carmel? Hey, I'm great. How are you today? I'm doing pretty good. How are you doing? Tell us I, about yourself. I can't complain. I can't complain. It's been a great day so far. Good. So go ahead and tell us a little about yourself, background, um, your experience, as well as um, your practice. Sure, sure. Um, of course, my name is Carmel Brown. I'm a licensed clinical professional counselor. Um, I, uh, I actually uh, started my career out 20 years ago as a probation and parole officer as well. So I've known Tyler that long as well. <laughs> hey, Tyler. <laughs> And, um, and, you know, honestly, uh, working there at 22, 23 years old, fresh out of college, I realized that most of the people that I was working with really needs, needed something other than the criminal justice system. And that um, I just didn't see a whole lot of uh, success with uh, individuals. And I supervised North City. I was down at District 7 Central, so our catchment area was was North City and most of the people there just had a lack of resources and um, lack of education and lack of support and I realized that uh, they were coming in and it was like just shuffling people in and out uh, most of them couldn't even uh, satisfy the $46 crime victims compensation fund fee that was just given to everybody that went through the system and so you know poverty and, and lack of resources education and all that and I just didn't feel that rehabilitation was occurring so uh, as bad as I wanted to be in a criminal justice system uh, going out of uh, gra undergrad school, I, I went back to, to graduate school for, um, for counseling and I just really decided to switch gears with it and and I've worked uh, in, in a forensic center there at Alden Forensic Center uh, over the years, and I've worked um, in a crisis center with individuals who were chronically mentally ill and homeless. Um, in the forensic center, they were all unfit to stand trial, not guilty by reason of insanity, so I, I still was able to use my criminal justice background in those settings. 
Um, and then uh, for the past five years, I've been in private practice. And um, in private practice, I work a lot with uh, couples. I work with uh, people suffering from mental illnesses, mostly depression and anxiety. Um, I work with a lot of professionals, a lot of military families. Um, I do work with some children, but I prefer to work with adults. And um, I, I work a lot with couples too. I've been married for 21, almost 22 years myself. So, so um, in, in addition to being a clinician, I have a lot of experience with marriage. So um, that I, I think I have a true passion for, for married couples. Um, in addition to that, um, I just, uh, I, I love self-care. I love to take care of myself as much as I like to take care of other people. And um, hey, I'm just here to join the party. <laughs> and the party is that we're having and stuff. And we actually had a good conversation before we actually uh, started going live. So definitely love to have your energy on the show. Yeah. Um, okay. Sliding to the left, we have Z5B, Cecilia Carter. What's going on, Soror? Hi, Fred. How you doing? How you got it? Uh, good, good. Well, um, thank you for having me, first of all. Um, yeah, so my name is Cecilia Carter of Cecilia Carter Counseling. Um, I am the founder and owner of my um, private practice. Um, in private practice, I work with adolescents, individual, I mean, adolescents, adults, um, and couples. Um, I emphasize on trauma, anxiety, depression, and um, maladaptive behaviors. Um, I also work for a non-for-profit where I go into the inner, inner city schools and I provide, uh, provide trauma therapy. So I have a lot of kids coming in with um, struggles around sexual assault. They've ex experienced domestic violence or have witnessed it. Um, just a, a, a lot of different issues that they're coming into the schools with. And it's a struggle for them to be able to kind of focus on what's going on when they're coming into school with trauma. So having someone there to support them and offer um, validation for the experiences is huge. Um, and we'll, it sounds like we're going to get into the, the discussion a little later about um, honoring and validating trauma within our culture. Um, and so I think it's huge for, uh, for us to have African-American supports within the schools. Um, how did I get started? So um, I am from the west side of Chicago, born and raised. Um, Hold up. Yeah. Hold yeah. up. <laughs> and so... Um, um, product of a single parent environment, uh, it was a struggle growing up. We didn't have much and didn't have a lot of access to a lot of resources. And so um, going to school and seeing people that looked like me, who supported me, who cared for me, um, put a fire in, um, in me to want to be something greater um, and support the community. Um, as I transitioned into graduate school, I worked um, in, the, um, in the North City area in Walnut Park. Okay. Um, and I took it there and it was so it was obvious that the children needed someone else who looked like them who could support them. The kids would come in with issues um, and they would try to talk to the teachers or they would try to talk to the school social workers. And of course, there's a lack of trust within the community when there are white social workers, sorry, um, coming in trying to explain or tell parents what to do. And so I saw a need for someone like myself to come in and support those parents, offer them ways to um, see their children different and see themselves differently um, and support them in that way. And so then it was obvious to me, I wanted to work with adolescents. So um, and for the not-for-profit, I work exclusively with adolescents, but in private practice, I, I do work with adults and um, adolescents. And that's my story. Well, thank you for sharing your story. Definitely appreciate it. So do you be juking? You be juking and stuff? Something like that, but. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> I, I went to SIU Carbondale for a year and stuff. I, that was my first deep taste of Chicago. Chicago. <laughs> yeah, I had a lot. Of, I went to SIU Carbondale too. Yeah. And tell, hey, well, then you know stuff. Baby. They came down on Amtrak tough. <laughs> yep. <laughs> so all good. Um, Next, we have um, Miss AKA um, Brandy Williams. Brandy, how are you doing? I'm good. Thank you for having me. Yeah, absolutely. Tell us a little bit about yourself, your background, and your area of uh, uh, expertise. Uh, I got into mental health in a kind of roundabout way. It's been less time for me. I was um, working as a financial aid um, counselor and director for um, HBCUs like Harris Stowe State University. 
and I worked with veterans on that level. And while working with veterans, I started to notice a lot of the mental health issues that they were experiencing, as well as just students who weren't veterans. And I um, developed a love and affinity for helping them with different issues and decided to, you know, become trained to uh, help with mental health. So I transitioned from that career into mental health around um, 2010. And um, upon graduation, began my career with the U.S. Department of Veterans Affairs and Suicide Prevention. So um, I'm a master's in mental health. Um, and I, uh, my main concentration is crisis prevention. So full time, um, I handle suicide prevention um, for veterans in Atlanta. Um, in a private practice, I work community uh, therapy and counseling, mostly for adolescents within the school system. Um, and my own um, practice is a non-traditional therapy uh, business, holistic. Um, I'm a level one master Reiki specialist. Um, and I also am an initiated priestess um in the religion of Paulo Mayambo. So my brand of therapy is more holistic and religious. Um, so it's a little mix of hot of gumbo. Oh we're losing you a little bit. I'm sorry I'm driving. And <laughs> religious perspective our our people do need um to get more back in contact with their their um their essence and i do use that within my practice when um when it's accepted well we definitely appreciate you having you on um i know you're driving and stuff so i've just been muting you and if um if you want to talk or whatever and stuff just raise your hand and so that way it doesn't um interfere with the background noise um like i said Absolutely. We're recording. thank you no problem no problem at all we actually like i said this is a uh, this is actually an extension of uh, the Mahogany Legacy Project. And for, for those who don't know, um, you've kind of seen it on my Facebook, and my IG, they talk about it from time to time. Uh, what's the Mahogany Legacy Project? Basically, it's a um, it's an insight. Hold on real quick. Brandy, can you mute yourself real quick? For some reason, I can't mute you. OK, thanks. Um, so the Mahogany Legacy Project actually was something born on based on several books that I read and uh, what, got it. Okay, so it's based on um, several books that I read, several studies I read, and what I wanted to do was to be able to uh, create a, a doctrine or, or a project or a concept where you're addressing five key areas, five key areas that affects um, some of the more negative prevailing outcomes that affects the black community. Those areas are in healthcare, education, financial independence, social change, as well as uh, employment, entrepreneurship. Um, this whole month for the first uh, several episodes, the first season of this podcast is dedicated towards healthcare. And you can't have healthcare unless you address mental health. And so um, I'm really grateful for the panelists to getting on board um, on this particular project. And for those who want to know more about these um, talented African American specialists, um, within the next week or so, you'll actually see the contact information on my page, drtduncan.com. And um, the reason why I'm putting them on my page is because uh, mental health is very needed, very much needed in the Black community. So um, just for their participation, I want to be able to make sure that if anybody's looking for resources and they're looking for some qualified specialists, people that they can relate to, if you're seeing this Facebook Live, you see that we all look like whatever, whoever that you see in the store, whoever you see in the club, whoever you see in the lounge, um, you know, we, we look just like everybody else. And we're given our time to be able to help you out and, um, and help others. You know, it, it doesn't have to necessarily be you. It could be somebody that you know um, you say, hey, you know what, I, I think I need some help referring somebody to someone and they can contact uh, Ms. Roy, they can t contact Mrs. Carter, they can talk, contact Mr. Amos, Mr. White. And so that's why we're here. Um, so before we go into the show, uh, Butler, is there anything you want to uh, say just real briefly before we kick it off?
Hold on, man. All right, go ahead, Ben. Can you hear me? Yeah. Well, I just want to thank everybody for their participation. Um, this is definitely a needed discussion in our community. And as, as a black male, I know that we don't, as amongst ourselves, we don't discuss mental health at all. So definitely hope, hopes this can spark uh, some conversation. And hopefully, you know, I know there are probably people everywhere dealing with depression and anxiety and don't know how to quite express it. As men, we always feel like we can't express our weaknesses to each other. So hopefully this gives each other, black men, I'm talking from black male's perspective, gives us the opportunity to be open to share if we're going through something mentally uh, with each other, not have to feel weak or soft or anything like that. So I'm, I'm, I'm encouraged and excited to see the, the results of people listening to the panel today. Absolutely, absolutely. So um, before we actually deep dive into the panel, we're just gonna kind of go in an overview and then we're gonna observe a moment of silence for Ahmaud Aubrey. Um, for two minutes and 23 seconds. Um, I, I'm pretty sure everybody knows uh, at the very, very most the, the basics of the uh, actual incident. And also, um, I, I have not looked at the video. I don't want to look at the video, um, but I've seen enough of the reports. Um, the reason why I don't want to look at the video and stuff is because I've seen a video or it's different iterations so many times. And so, you know, that's something that we're going to definitely have to cover. Um, in the podcast and as well, as well as the Facebook video. Um, I'm going to run through some facts and um, we're going to start off with uh, Tyler. And what we're going to do, everybody, is that we're, we want everybody to have an equal opportunity to speak. And so we're going to go round table. So uh, every question or um, every situation that we'll bring up, you know, I'm going to rotate it around to each, I guess you want to say a keynote for that particular sec sec segment. And they're going to speak, and then everybody else has an opportunity to uh, to jump in as well. So here are some facts that I did on the research. According to the Department of Health and Human Services, Office of Minority Health, they, uh, the research revealed that Blacks are 20% more likely to experience serious mental health problems. Black youth exposed to violence are at greater risk for uh, post-traumatic stress disorder by over 25%. Suicide was the second leading cause of death for African Americans between the ages of 15 to 24. Depression, anxiety, and low self-esteem are reported two to three times higher for adults over the age of 18, and Blacks are less likely to utilize mental health therapy due to lack of access, um, faith-based beliefs, and perceived stigmas among others in the community. Um, this is these are statistics and a lot of it is born on research um i know that each of you have seen different variations of this report but at, tyler what do you feel um the state of black america is on a from a mental health perspective from your perspective first of all i want to preface this by saying none of those statistics surprise me mm. um I also encourage, and I'm sure hearing the the myriad of, of experience with trauma and, and, and trauma information, that this isn't news to anybody. I think it's important to also look at how important ACEs are, which are uh, adverse childhood effects. I mean, adverse childhood experiences, I'm sorry. Um, I think if you were to look at some of those statistics and the implications, of what happens when young when children are exposed to adverse traumas early on in life, the things, the implications, and the things that potential consequences that they are most likely statistically to endure, it is sobering. Um, so one of the things I'm glad to see is that there seems to be a shift. A lot of you know historically, you know we've been therapy within our communities, not just black communities, but more so in impoverished communities, has been taboo. You know, it's everything is handled in house. You know, you know what goes on in this house stays in this house, or that's our issue. That's our problem. We work on that at home. We don't, you know, or and I'm, I'm not to offend anybody, or we just don't prey on it. And I think a lot of the shift now is understanding that sometimes prayer just is not enough. Um, and I think a lot of churches are starting to to grasp and accept that idea too. So in terms of, I remember one of the first clients I got in in private practice was a Caucasian female who was coming because her dog had died now 
of all people, you know, we have experienced, we can have 500 different losses. We can lose two or three, you know, family members. We can use, uh, we can lose, we can be going through a divorce. We can be going through a terminal illness and we will still be saying, oh, I don't need that. That's not for us. Historically, therapy in general has been looked at as a wealthy white woman's embarkment. And I think now there's starting to be a shift when we realize how, how much of an impact early traumas have on people when we're realizing. So I'm, I'm seeing now um, a change in referral sources. I'm seeing a lot of even some of the most prominent churches or, or pastors who, who are ordained and recognized and decorated are starting to say, you know what, I can't handle this. Let me refer you to somebody else. So when we see a shift like that, we recognize that it's being recognized and it's being um, supported. So I think that alone is causing more people to more people that look like us to embrace it. When you have now people are becoming more astute and learned about employee assistance programs, they're starting to realize, hey, I'm paying for insurance mm -hmm. every day. I mean, every month, you know, this is something this is something that I could be getting. So they're starting to utilize that. I have a lot of people that I see um, in uh, for Southern Illinois, who have a Medicaid card, who are starting to realize, you know, I can, I can actually get mental health services with my medical card. I think our biggest issue and our biggest caveat to us getting mental health therapy is still us being shrouded in, in embarrassment or shame. I don't want other people to know what I've endured. I don't want other people to know my secret. I don't know other people to know what I've been through. I don't want other people to know anybody, even a trained professional to know what I've been subjected to. So I think as, as we start to see more people who look like us, who can readily relate to some of the things that we've gone through, that they've gone through, whether it's uh, traumatic events, whether it's single parentage, whether it is, you know, living in impoverished areas and just being disadvantaged, whether it's just not having, you know, having an absent parent. I think when they start to realize not only does this person look like me, but they can readily relate to a lot of the things that I have encountered and endured, whether it's sexual abuse or trauma or whatever the case may be, there starts to be a little bit more of a relaxation and a, and a general receptivity to it. Anybody else want to jump on on that uh, or add? Yeah, I would like to say, um, uh, kind of going along with what Tyler was saying, the African American experience here in America is rooted in trauma, right? From Absolutely. the beginning of slavery to Jim Crow to it in the red line, anything you think of, our experience has been rooted in trauma. And so we start to internalize the trauma and it becomes a part of our culture. Um, it's It becomes a norm within the society, within our sub society and it becomes a norm within our um in our household in our communities anxiety is like it becomes a thing everybody's always hyper vigilant you got folks always yelling and screaming at one another not knowing how to validate one another not knowing how to get close because we're scared to get close mm -hmm. the idea of um making long-term decisions they talked about the the kids in chicago being outside um despite the mayor's um the mayor stay at home um, uh, decree, I guess I can't, I couldn't think of the word, but. <laughs> stay at home orders? Stay at home order. Yeah, but okay. the, but the, the fact is, is that when you have experienced trauma in the way that a lot of those teens have experienced and a lot of adults experience, the idea of le looking ahead and making decisions, long-term decisions about the, what the future is gonna look like, when I don't know what tomorrow is gonna look like. And all of that stuff is that rooted in anxiety. And then we can bring in depression. We can bring in relationship issues. We can uh, bring in so many th connections between mother and daughters, huge. Um, a lot of it, again, stems from that trauma that we have experienced as a people and it's trickled down into our households. So mental health <laughs> is a struggle for us, but it wasn't, it wasn't started by us. It was given to us, but we have the opportunity now to fix it because we have folks, um, there are more African-American mental health uh, professionals in the field now than ever. And so we have more access to it. We have more uh, um, organizations who are providing free access to um, people of color, not in the way like uh, Tyler spoke about where it used to be a rich white folks thing. Now is we have access to it. And so we have to normalize it and make it okay and encourage one another to go. 
Um, you know what? I'm going to ask a question um, based on that. And then I would like for uh, Brandy to go ahead, Brandy and Carmel to kind of jump on that. And then um, Toya and, and uh, Tessie, we're going to jump on another question that's going to be aimed for both of y'all, okay? So you were saying about access. Um, I, in the research that I'm writing on, it's the, I know that access is one of the biggest challenges for uh, African Americans, not only just for healthcare, um, but for mental health. Um, for those who don't have, um, you know, uh, insurance, uh, for those who might, you know, and this is actually prior to the pandemic, I don't know what's gonna look like during the pandemic or afterwards, but uh, prior to the pandemic, you had people who did not have health insurance. How are they able to gain access for uh, mental health services, Brandy? Personally, um, within the private practice that I work with, we tend to make access um, a little bit easier because we will accept um, sliding fee um, patients. Uh, the, the private practice that I work for is run by an African-American woman who I went to undergraduate school with. And um, she thinks it's very important for everyone to have um, access to mental health. So what she often does is either she will offer um, a sliding scale fee or she will allow you to be seen by um, an intern and she will supervise so that you don't have to pay out of pocket anything. Um, you know, that's a blessing for so many people. There aren't, you know, there are some um, practices that do offer those kinds of benefits, but, you know, not many. And so the, the main thing is, is finding those, um, doing searches for those. I'm sure it would be very beneficial, um, you know, to have lists available to the community to know who gives those kinds of benefits. There are organizations called Give an Hour, where um, prof qualified professionals offer uh, an hour of therapy services to people who are veterans or within veterans' families. So that's something, you know, there are a lot of African-American veterans and military families who could use those, um, those resources. So access just, there are a lot of people who offer, you know, pro bono work. It's just finding those people. Okay, Carmel? Uh, well, uh, I think we certainly have to uh, mention the fact that uh, community mental health agencies uh, are usually available for individuals who have medical medical cards or um, they don't have any benefits at all. So um, I strongly encourage people who don't have any insurance to uh, seek out the community mental health agencies in their area. Um, they, they are usually taking clients. Um, sometimes it's hard to get in because they have such a huge number of people coming in, but it's very difficult uh, if you don't have insurance. Um, like uh, she just said, uh, was it Brandy? Just mm -hmm. saying about, um, you know, just uh, in private practice, it's very difficult to get in if you don't have uh, health insurance. Um, some private practices, I, I know I have an intern from time to time. I have one currently. Um, sometimes I will have her to see individuals for free who don't have insurance. Um, and that helps her to get her hours in. And typically our interns are master's level. You know, they're just about done with their master's degree. So they're, uh, and they're supervised by us and trained by us. So they get to shadow us. So, um, you know, they have some experience and uh, they've pretty much gone all the way through a graduate program. Can I, can I piggyback real quick and say something, Terrence? Yeah, for, uh, briefly, please. Okay. There's also, you know, I, I encourage you, most federally funded, like uh, healthcare centers, they have something built in where you can access, um, if, even if you have a medical card or you have medical or you have Medicare, you can go ahead and kind of get a sliding, sliding scale fee. Sometimes that's as nominal as 10 or $15. So mm -hmm. it's, again, that's when it's feder uh, federally funded programs, a lot of them will make some concessions. Um, and then also private practitioners can do that. I also encourage people in terms of accessibility, EAP programs, which is very underutilized. And mm -hmm. that accounts usually four to six free sessions for the person who's employed for each occurrence. That means if you lose somebody, you get, you get six sessions. If you go through a divorce, you get sessions. If your child is acting up in school, your child gets sessions. So I encourage people to really find out about their EAP um, benefits as well. Um, thank you, Tyler. Um, so one thing I wanted you guys to take away right off the bat there is an opportunity to seek mental health services. 
Um, so when you feel like that you're not capable of doing it, um, there are ways of going about doing it. So um, don't feel like that your health insurance information or lack of thereof is um, going to prevent you from seeking those services. And that's very good information that you guys have put out there because I didn't know that myself. So I'm glad to have you guys expert opinion. Um, gentlemen, I saved you for this one only because we actually had an agenda out earlier and um, you know, the, the events of this past week have actually um, changed some of the scope of the agenda. So I've wanted to speak from a black male perspective. Um, Toya, I've seen you personally work with uh, you know, children throughout the St. Louis area, especially young black men. And um, I know that you know, this really means a lot to you for your personal passion and for your private practice. Um, Tessie, I met you, um, you know, just right now, but um, just hearing from everything that you're saying, I'm pretty sure that this is a, a, a core focus of what you're trying to do, too. Um, we had two situations, one in Indianapolis uh, with Sean Reed um, when he was uh, shot by a police officer. And then we had a situation where it's basically, for all intents and purposes, a, a modern day lynching of Ahmaud Aubrey um, down in Brunswick, Georgia, uh, got reported two months late. Um, from your perspective and Butler, I would like for you to jump in and actually help moderate this one. Um, what do you feel is the current state of the mental health for black men in America? Um, Atoya? Um, I mean, current state broad brushstroke, right? Um, I mean, I think there's, first of all, I think that something that's very important for us to acknowledge is the link between mental health and education because for many of our families, their introduction to the mental health field comes through education. Okay. So when we talk about, you know, that that typically is the conduit, right? So when we talk about this misdiagnosis, overdiagnosis, all these things, their first introduction to a therapist or a social worker or whatever have you is because they've been told something is wrong or there's a behavior issue or something going wrong with their child, right? Mm -hmm. And so that, that creates this awkward dynamic first in education but then also in this translation over to the mental health field, because nobody wants to be told that something's wrong with their child, which is if something's wrong with my child, then you're gonna tell me something's wrong with me, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And then it starts this snowball rolling downhill again. So there's, there's just this link between education and the mental health field that has to be um, addressed. With regard to the, the, the current state, I mean, honestly, it's no different. I think it's just that certain things are uh, visible. A lot of things are visible now. And, um, you know, they have to, they, they've contributed to um, the deterioration of the black family for decades, obviously. And so now there are more things that are just visible to the naked eye that we have to, that can't, can no longer go unnoticed or can no longer go unaddressed um, because they continue, you know, obviously to get, I'm not necessarily say get worse, but again, they're more, again, they're more visible. The black family has been deteriorating for decades and now we understand why we understand the systemic things that were the cause for that. We understand the choices that uh, people in and from black and brown spaces had to had to make. We understand how, how women had to choose between husbands or the welfare system. Like we get, we have all that information, right? So now it's what are we going to do um, with regard to as men addressing our individual selves, addressing um, the, the trauma, the systemic oppression, the things that affect us individually um, without shame and guilt, right? And I think that's the that those are the things that are often attached to this particular process is being able being able to overcome uh, the shame and guilt attached with feeling, you know, weak or inadequate or whatever have you. And so one of the panelists said earlier just about this has to be normal. This is no different than going to the doctor for a, a routine checkup. This has to be something that we promote as normality because we say it's normal, not because of any other narrative other than the one that we create that says that for men and boys in and from black and brown spaces, this is normal because we say it is, and this is the end result. You being a, a healthier individual, which leads to healthier marriages and families, the reestablishment of the black family and healthier communities, and it can be accomplished outside of that. Absolutely, absolutely. Tessie? Uh, uh, well said, Etoya. Um, the original question was the state of uh, black folk or black men due to these two uh, tragic uh, incidents. Um, and I can't, like, like you told you said, that's a very broad stroke and I can't really speak because I don't want to ever be the voice for all of my people, just Absolutely. those people who believe in me. So what, what I will say is that what I hope 
comes from this, what I hope comes from Brother Ahmad's life and, 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 and certainly the other young man in Indianapolis is that we create spaces where we can have healthy conversation about these type of incidents. Uh, so many times, especially as men, and I, and I will speak from a male perspective on this one, so many times as men, we, we, we allow ourselves to be filled with rage and, and, and anger, and we go off on what we would do if. And, 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 and really the actuality is in that moment, you're, you're going to do nothing. You're just going to allow stress to set in on yourself. You're going to allow tension to set in on yourself. But what you could do is have a healthy conversation about this. You can sit down with your sons and your daughters and your family, and you can have healthy conversation. You can allow them to open up and tell you how they feel about it. And you can lead the way by opening up yourself and telling people how you feel about it. I intend to have healthy, uh, heartfelt conversation with my family and my friends concerning this. Of course, it angers me. Of, of, of course, it saddens me. But what can I do to make sure to, that I'm doing my part to make sure that the next one doesn't happen? You know, we have to spread this awareness. We have to keep it going. We have to stay abreast. I don't watch the news for entertainment. I watch the news to find out what's going on around me so that when I'm working with people who may be traumatized by these things, I can have some sort of working knowledge. So as a professional and a clinician, I take the onus on myself to know as much as I possibly can as soon as I possibly can. I know that that's going to breed trauma. That's going to trigger someone else's trauma. Someone else lost a family member to gun violence, be it a racial attack or a, a interracial attack. And, and so sometimes when those wounds get open, we don't know where to go. We don't know what to do. We don't know who to see. Well, you can look at the beautiful brown and black faces in this panel, and that tells you where you can go and who you can see. And that's what we're here for. And there are other people outside of this panel that you can go see. But the, the idea of it is, is to sit down and talk, have that healthy conversation that can help you push forward. Because at the end of the day, life is for the living. Those who are no longer with us have an opportunity to cease now but we must go on. Life is for the living and we have to continue living. And I'm gonna continue living well on my end and I expect my children to continue living well and I expect those people that I love to continue living well. And so I offer my services uh, at, you know, to people who want to come and sit down and talk. You know, let's form some groups. Let's, let's go in these churches and talk more than about what happened way back AD and BC. You know what I'm saying? Let's go ahead and talk about some of these things. Let's use the forms that we already have in place to go ahead and tackle some of these very hard issues so that we as black men and black boys can start healing. And then like you told you said, we can turn right around and instrument and, and, and lead our families back into healing. Absolutely. Absolutely. You know what? And we're going to also give the rest of the panelists an opportunity to speak as well. We're going to start off with Brandy and then uh, Butler, um, I would like for you to moderate for the next uh, 15, 20 minutes. And then Charletta, you'll go ahead and uh, close it out. Okay, I gotta get where I can forget everybody's name. I'm gonna okay. go. Uh, Brandy, um, anything that you would like to add on this particular discussion? Um, I just think that it's important for us to remember um, with all of these traumatic events that are happening um, right now, it seems that there's something every year, every six months um, pertaining to the black community where we are seeing people being victimized right in front of our very eyes, um, watching it on TV, seeing it replayed over and over again. Um, these types of traumatic um, experiences cause PTSD for many of us. Um, and we don't even realize that we're being affected because we feel that it's because it's not a family member, because it's not someone that we know that we may not be being affected, but you are. Um, and you could be walking around feeling anxiety daily and not be seeking medical and mental health attention. And if you're feeling different, if you're feeling stressed, if you're feeling um, a lot of anxiety, reach out. Um, there are so many professionals who are willing to help um, the people on this panel, um, colleagues that we have. Um, turn off the TV if you need to. Um, back away um, and don't watch because um, you know, just overexposure to traumatic uh, experiences is not something that you want to continue um, to expose yourself to, but be vigilant um, in, in taking care of your mental health and the mental health of your family, your children, the people that are around you. Carmel? Yes. 
Um, you know, I think one thing that we must communicate in the black community is what trauma actually is. I think we've gotten very confused uh, with what that entails, and we somehow believe it's uh, one big catastrophic event, like um, an occurrence of abuse has had to happen. Um, you don't have to be sexually abused or have been physically abused or anything like that. Trauma can be uh, many small occurrences throughout your life, throughout your childhood, and we ignore those small things. Like Brandy said, uh, we're exposed to trauma all the time at a much higher rate than other people, other races. Um, I can give you a personal example today. I was out walking my dog about an hour before we started this uh, podcast, and uh, I, I had earbuds in, and I couldn't hear. I bent over to tie my, my shoes, and um, I could hear. I heard somebody say something. I look up, and I jumped. And there was a person running past me. It was my 15-year-old son running through the neighborhood. Mm. And, and it scared me. But once I looked up and realized it was him, I was relieved that it was him. And I smiled. I, I couldn't see or hear anybody until I saw, saw it was him. I, was, uh, I wasn't relieved until then. But if I had been someone else, they may not have been relieved once they realized it was him, as I was. So, um, you know, and, and I had, and I watched him run away and, you know, I had all types of thoughts and I actually took my phone out and recorded him running in the opposite direction of me and was thinking that, that, you know, although I was startled when I looked up and saw his face, although I couldn't hear anything because I had my earbuds in, I was like, oh, that's my son. That's great. You know, he smiled, I smiled and went on, but some people might be agitated. They may be angry. They may be suspicious if he were to run past them in broad daylight on, on such a beautiful plain day, you know, and, um, and, and that's trauma for us as parents to have to think about those things because no other race has to have thoughts like that. And, mm -hmm. and uh, you, we do have to start with our children because, uh, I work with a lot of military families in private practice, as I mentioned earlier, and sometimes they bring their kids in for having difficulty adjusting to a move or transition. Obviously, they're uprooted. They have to leave their friends behind and everything that they know every few years. And, you know, we have children in the Black community that have been exposed to so many things and nobody's thought about taking them to see a therapist. Yeah. And, uh, you know, they may have had murders in their families. Someone may be uh, using substances in their families. And a lot of things that we are exposed to uh, that come with poverty, that come with lack of education, lack of resources, and, and poor mental health. Um, and not to mention not knowing your family history in addition to that. Uh, our kids are exposed to a lot of trauma. And as Tyler mentioned earlier, ACEs, those adverse childhood um, experiences, they have a lot to do with how we end up what shape we're in by the time we reach adulthood. So if we can catch that at an early age, um, that would certainly be beneficial. Cecilia? Yeah, um, I think that it's important as we, you know, experience trauma as a collective that we um, learn to offer compassion to one another. Um, and that looks like giving each other grace to grieve in the way that we need to. Everybody grieves differently. And so when you get on Facebook, people say, oh, you shouldn't go march, or you shouldn't go do this, or you shouldn't go do that. That's invalidating somebody else's experience. So creating safe space for folks to feel, act, behave, and do what they need to do in order to process their experiences is huge. Um, and as we start to look at um, responses that we can do as a community, we can start by creating safe spaces just like this. This would be a great safe space for someone, um, an African-American male or female to look and say, okay, this is, this is somewhere safe where I can talk about what's going on with me. Um, there are black, there are, uh, are groups of black men that have um, group talks where they talk about how their experiences are and what their experiences are as a black man. As a black people, we have uh, collective experiences, but my husband's experience is different than mine here in America because he's a man and I'm a woman. So creating safe spaces amongst each other is huge. And then figuring out a way how to rechannel some of that anger that we're experiencing or, or, or fear or whatever the, the uh, emotion is, figuring out a way to um, have a, in a healthy way, to right. rechannel those experiences, maybe through activism or supporting one another, or um, there, I saw a lot of people today uh, run in the name of the young man that was slain. So um, if I think overall, offering compassion to one another and then finding a way to um, 
prove yourself through different avenues um, is very important. Appreciate that. Tyler, um, your thoughts and comments, and then Butler, uh, it will be your turn to go ahead and start moderating. All good. I think, okay, I think I couldn't agree more with what the predecessors have said. Um, we, we're exposed so much to trauma that there's a desensitization that comes along with it. You know, Brandy talked about post-traumatic stress disorder, and I think it goes undiagnosed or underdiagnosed because we don't think kids can be traumatized. We don't think that we can be traumatized. There's a such thing as indirect trauma, you know what I mean? And it, and it, it can be just as debilitating. One of the things that I do realize is that um, with that desensitization, I was at my parents' house. They live in, in Edgemont, off, right off 80th in State for the people who live on, who are familiar with the uh, Illinois side. Um, it was a bright summer day. Kids are riding their bikes, you know, just in the neighborhood. There was a barrage of gunfire. This was just last summer. Not one kid stopped. Now, one kid got off their bike. Now, one parent came outside to see what was going on. And I think that was that was devastating to me. But it wasn't surprising. Our kids are desensitized to that. Last year, we had a, um, I was at, there was a, in the Hindu community in St. Louis, there was an Indian boy who committed suicide. Within a week of that occurring, I was asked to come and sit as an expert panelist um, at the Hindu, uh, the Hindu center in St. Louis. And I'm thinking to myself, I looked at all of the schools, all of the churches, all of the community centers in, in, in East St. Louis that I passed up to go over here to speak to a, 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 an Indian community about a suicide when our kids are exposed to that every single day. But because we're desensitized to it, because we've become so accustomed to it because we've gotten to the point where it's you know and i can't remember who said it but it was you know it's just it's, it's the same story it's just a different face it's just a different place it's the same slaughtering it's just a different and the outcomes are outcomes are the same so we don't even get riled up riled up about it you know so i i just think it, it until we can learn how to mobilize quicker we're at the point now just being outraged is not enough you know, just being upset and us, you know, this is a wonderful start. You know, you have a plus, I mean, a myriad of spectacularly trained people from everything from VA uh, issues to boys who've been traumatized to family therapists and people who are trying to restore families. You have one stop shopping right here. But the unfortunate part is that the people who need to hear it often aren't listening. So the, the increased exposure, the not being okay with, well, you know, this is what's happening. It's not enough just for us to have a discussion amongst ourselves, because guess what? We know what to do. You know, this that's funny that you said that the last I want to take hold of that last couple of sentences that you said. Um, you know, the entire day, actually the last couple of days, I'm not gonna lie, I was beyond bummed out about it. And then just uh another, you know poke in the eye, you saw what happened with Michael Flynn. He used to be the former national security advisor. You know, he lies to Congress and then, you know, he had his crew to be able to get him out. And, you know, I was thinking about that going into this particular podcast and I'm just sitting thinking like, there has to be not only, well, this, this topic is actually very beneficial, but, you know, we, we have to start changing the narrative um, in, on, on multiple fronts. Um, not only, or should we have, you know, qualified specialists like yourself to be able to help those who are going through whatever their particular situation or whatever their trauma may be? Um, we also we we also need to start encouraging more people to start becoming judges and lawyers. Um, we need to start encouraging more people to get higher up in the ladder of corporate America um, because it, it comes down to a lot of economic power. You know, I mean. You talk about how many mental health specialists are available. You look at how many, how are we doing better financially as uh, African Americans, especially compared to 20, 30 years ago, but it's not enough, you know? So I think that it has to be a multi-pronged approach um, so we can stop being business as usual um, because once we start uh, wielding the economic power and we start having the more stronger political influences um, from a grassroots level all the way up, I, I think you, you start really chipping away some of the, the ugly truth is what's going on because otherwise, you know, like Tyler said, it's, you know, it's either, you know, Mr. Aubrey today, it could be somebody else tomorrow. And, you know, what then? I mean, I said that 
a, a, a march is not going to do too much of anything. I, that's just mm -hmm. my personal opinion. So, um, and some people are not going to like it. So what, you know, but the reality is the stuff, I mean, they've seen us march, they've seen us boycott, they've seen us do the sit downs and stuff. I mean, we have to do something different and stuff because if it wasn't for um, Abrams, if it wasn't for Abrams and the push that she had in um, for Georgia and having her influences in Georgia, that story never would have been brought out to light. Uh, Tessie. One of the things we have to do is stop getting complacent. We have to literally stop waiting on the next incident to happen for Absolutely. us to mobilize. The time is now. One of the lessons that my father taught me when I was young was always to prepare for war while the time was at peace. Yep. We, it seems like so many times we get complacent. We make our big paychecks. We move into our big houses. We drive our fancy cars. We put Jordans on the feet of our children and we get complacent in our lives. And then all of a sudden, Aubrey gets gunned down in broad daylight by henchmen and now we want to rile up and revel up. We need to be doing that stuff on a daily basis. And so that's what I use my ministry for. That's what I use my, my practice for so that I can be helping people every single day and not just waiting on the next incident to happen. We raise our children amidst this stress and trauma that, that we went through when we had our own uh, adverse childhood experiences. If we haven't dealt with it, then we continue to pass that along. So that's the legacy that we're giving. We want to give different types of legacy. So we have to become aware now that we were traumatized when we were children. So we have to do something different so we can teach our children different. And then maybe we won't have another Aubrey. You know what I'm saying? Or maybe the next time if we do, then we can truly do something different besides march and go run two miles, 2.23 miles in his honor. You know what I'm saying? His honor needs to be represented deeper than that. But we're not ready for that. We're not ready for that because we don't want to we don't want to risk losing what we have. We don't want to take an opportunity or a chance to lose what we've so-called established, which is really just what they've given us. Yeah. So and I, I'm going to step off that soapbox, but I just had to get that off. <laughs> we might come back to it, you know. So, I mean, we definitely could come back to the uh, to the entire scope of the topic because I know it's not going to go away. Um, I know there's going to be more information that's going to be brought up. We do have another uh, show uh, or panel discussion next weekend. So based on the feedback and, you know, that we get from the audience, we'll definitely can uh, bring this back up again and stuff because this definitely cannot be resolved within 10 to 15 minutes. Um, Butler. Actually, uh, what Sessie said kind of, kind of, uh, Oh, you know what? I'm going to kill your bird too one day. I'm just going to put that on the record. <laughs> you know what? I'm, I'm actually at, at, at my mom's house now and I get, I guess it's, it's the bird follow me. I guess so, the bird's part of the podcast. You know. <laughs> <laughs> Go yeah, ahead, bro. We, we might start giving them credits or whatnot. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That bird. But, uh, going back to what Sessie said, um, real quick, when you talked about, uh, preparing during, peace times for war um what are some things that, that we can do to, because I, I don't know what we can do to prepare for one of our brothers being gunned down in the street like like what can we do to like you said talking about prevention what can what can we do to prevent something like that as far as being prepared for it so as a, as, a, as a black man that's listening if you're a head of a family or you're the head of yourself right now you can come and get this work. You can come and get this help that you need so that you can clear your mind so that you can be better prepared and perhaps you can see these things coming. We walk around these people and act like they're not here. See, I stay vigilant. And I'm, I'm just going to go ahead and say it because I'm not afraid anyway. I go to the gun range. You know what I'm saying? I, I, I own weapons. I own ammunition. I'm prepared. I don't ever want to have to use them. But if I have to, I'm ready. So we can, we, can, we can go ahead and get carry concealed license. We can take gun classes so that we know how to use weaponry if we need it. But in the meantime, we can also go and get our hearts healed so that we can receive the blessings and the mercy that we need in the meantime. So it's multiple different angles that you can come at to handle this problem. But you got to, if you, don't, if you stay ready, you ain't got to get ready. See, I don't want to have to go out there and protect my son or avenge my son. But God knows I am and I will if I have to. That's the type of passion that we need to walk around with. So, no, you don't see me smiling in the store. I'm not the friendliest person to walk up on. But these ain't friendly times either. You're going to respect my space. 
I'm going to be the last one you come at, not the first one you come at. And I mean that from the bottom of my heart. I smile at my sisters. I shake my brother's hand. But you just ain't running up on me and mine. When you see my name, it's going to come with something. You're going to understand me you know, or you're going to feel me. And I hate to be that way, but that's what it is. I'll be 50 years old in August. As far as I'm concerned, that's how it is. I ain't really got a whole lot of time left to be dealing with this, so I'm going to live mine in peace. And if I have to do it with a frown on my face and a gad in my back pocket, then so be it. But I'm going to have peace. I'm going to have peace, and mine going to have peace too. Salute. I love that answer. I, I'm 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 completely with 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 being ready and 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 staying ready and I I can I can hear your passion and 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 your voice for for what you're doing. Um, another question. I guess we can I can pose this to everybody. Just um, just advice. Just just for a black man in America. Um, we get the we get the I guess stereotype of angry black man a lot, but I don't see any way. Of, how how do you how how can you not be angry at all the things that have, have been done to our people? We continue continue to happen to our people. So how 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 as a black man do we find a balance? Because I I don't want I don't want to be angry all the time, but I don't want to be numb to what's going on either. I want I want to feel it just so I know it's there. Like we see so many uh, of our brothers and sisters getting killed in the streets, sometimes by the hands of each other, by others. Um, so how how do we what's the best way to deal with the anger but still uh i guess trying to find a balance with it because i don't want to be filled with anger but i do want to feel it because i know it's there because i never want to be numb to what's going on around me i want to first i want to say i think for me as an african-american female clinician even being exposed to two or three black male clinicians on this thread, I think is, is, start, is a good start. And I say that because so many, you know, broken children become broken adults. And when I'm dealing with, you know, young men, 13, 14, 15 years old, who don't have fathers, who don't have, you know, sufficient role models, who already are despondent and feel desperate, who already, who have already have uh, these morbid ideas that it's a huge feat just to make it to 18. So if I make it to 18, they're not thinking beyond that. That's the, they've accomplished something by making it to 18. So to see when you're talking about that deep seated anger, when if it's recognized early enough and we can put them in touch in that safe space that somebody was talking about earlier, putting them in a safe space, putting them in a position to talk to men healed or healing men that, in a, that are in a position to facilitate that same healing for them, men that look like them, that come from some of the same places and spaces that they do, people, some of the men who have experienced some of the same, you know, uh, adversities that they have, that's a, a step in the right direction. Those men that look like them can help facilitate and kind of uh, alleviate some of that anger and angst and frustration. But, you know, when, when you, and I'm not saying that us as female clinicians that we can't be if you help because we can but i cannot tell you the number of times or the exasperation or frustration i feel when i'm looking at a young man that i'm helping and i'm saying to myself if only there was one person one man that he could talk to that could validate him that could you know assure him that there's more to life than beyond 18 years old that you know that could give him some inspiration and hope and insight to make better choices and decisions that can help him on this healing path, he would be on the right path. But in the absence of that, you know, they resort to what they know. So I think in terms of the anger and the trying to get some resolution to some of those um, unresolved issues, that angst and anxiety that you're talking about, um, I think it starts with, again, introduction to people who look like them. If it's not an actual therapist, a mentoring group, um, you know, if, you know, some kind of programming that's long-term and not just, you know, mishandle funds that they only are, are part of for three months and then you know because again what does that do somebody gets involved in their life they're there for two or three months or a couple sessions before you know it they out and then there's another abandonment so you know it's just kind of breaking that cycle you're not going to break any kind of cycle until you I'm identify sure. what the is and change something exactly. sorry you raise your hand yeah, I just want to, um, I think, you know, Tyler brought up, I mean, everybody has for the most part, but I mean, just 
the importance of relationships, right? And so there's so many things that we could talk about or address, you know, and, and Tessie brought up the, you know, 2.23 miles, or, you know, which is, which is dope. But what about tomorrow? What are you going to do tomorrow? Like, are you going to do 2.23 miles because it helps you improve your, your personal uh, health? Are you going to do 2.23 miles because it helps you become a healthier person? I understand. And I'm, I'm totally with the representation and honoring my brother, no doubt about it. But proactively, this is what we need to do anyway. This is what we need to do every single day because it helps us become healthier people, right? Everybody doesn't need therapy, but everybody needs relationships. And so I think in just in this dispensation and in many others, right, can we, how about, you know, 2.23 random acts of kindness? Are you going to do your 2.23 miles and then go back to being the same person that you were? Are you, you know what I mean? Can we do 223 random acts of kindness? Can you say 223 nice things? to people that you know, just whatever, these things that contribute to us becoming healthier individuals, again, in improving these relationships. So to answer the question with regard to anger, so when I'm, you know, working with my clients and my own son, so anger is a secondary emotion for the most part. So what's at the core of this, right? Are we talking about fear? Are we talking about guilt? Are we talking about shame? What exactly are we talking about? So we can have conversations about what the core issues actually are. And so also, like, like, like Tyler said, having consistency in these programs, because ultimately, unfortunately, what we have is, is we have these, we have these definitions of trauma that have to be consistent with the checks that are being cut, as opposed to what is actually needed in the community, right? So I, yeah, I'm going to pass the collection plate, because it's time to get, we, 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 we about to get with it right now. So pass the collection plate. So we have to, we have to understand that trauma is as much about the individual person's response to the event than the actual event that occurred. Because just like we have individual love languages, personality types, character strengths, and so on, we all respond to traumatic events differently. And that's what creates the trauma that we that becomes what is manifested, right? And these day-to-day -day interactions or what we see or what generates the behavior or referral at school because we don't take the time to build the relationships in such a way that keep kids from getting suspended and all this other type of foolery that's taking place that again, just, just, just continues the cycle, right? School to prison pipeline, all these things that are about the checks being cut. So at the end of the day, it's consistency in these programs, it's consistency in, in the building of relationships, it's about utilizing ways to improve our personal self-care, whether that's our physical health, our emotional health, our spiritual health, whatever that is for you. So again, like to, we don't have to wait until the end. We have all this when, when the event actually happens and we can do these things proactively, socially, being socially connected and all the things that we know, right? We're multiple degree professionals on this and we know about social connectedness. We know about all these things that can how we eat. We know about all these different things and these are the things that we have to focus on. And so again, when this event happens, we're all better prepared to deal with it as a community. And we don't have these factions that occur now because like, oh, we don't need to go do this and da 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 So when the event happens, we can't stand in unity because all these factions have been created. Yep, yep. Anybody else want to jump on? Actually. Yeah, real quick. Um, we, we have to put therapy in everything. Uh, uh, Stacy D.H., and, and, and Tony Frierson both said it on this live feed that we, we got to put therapy in everything. If you coach on the team, all of these different organizations that we consistently give our kids to 10, 15, 20 kids at a time, we teach them how to do crossovers. We teach them how to catch passes. We teach them how to high jump, but we're not giving those kids therapy. And we know that they've been traumatized, especially our children that's in the inner city. We have to not be afraid to put therapy into everything that we do. Because just like Brother Butler said, we don't want to be filled with anger. But since we feel the anger, what will we do with it? Therapy will teach you what to do with that anger. Therapy can teach you and show you how to use that anger as a motivator to do better, want better, and get better. But we absolutely have to put therapy into everything. It belongs everywhere we are and everywhere our children are. It belongs there. Absolutely. And I think we have to get away from uh, thinking that it has to be for children who are troubled or who are in, habitually in trouble, that uh, we want to work with our kids before they get to that point. Right. Being proactive as opposed to reactive. Mm -hmm. You know, I get, I get calls in private practice. I get parents, of, you know, uh, Caucasian parents that will call because they're starting to see some changes with their kids. They're starting to get phone calls versus some of some of some of us won't call until Johnny been 
suspended 930 times. And then now it's, I got to do something. I got to do something to get this school off my back. So it's a matter of being proactive versus being reactive. I think another thing is being able to, and this is a skill that you learn within therapy, to, you spoke about, um, Tyler, um, the anger, being able to connect that and allow yourself to feel it and notice it when it comes up. Because yes. so often we have these feelings and we dismiss it or we push it away or it shows up as something else. Mm -hmm. So honoring the feeling, learning how to uh, work through it and process it and um, learning some coping skills to manage it. And when you learn those skills, you teach everybody else around you so that they can understand, number one, when I'm showing up and I'm distant, what is that? Oh, that means Cece is probably feeling some type of way. Now, how can I support her um, and helping her to get through that instead of ignoring it and pushing it away? So as you learn this, right, this you know, you everybody else around you. <laughs> Thank you, Pat. You know, I, I like to do an exercise with my kids. It's called the anger iceberg. And it's an iceberg with anger being at the tip and all the other emotions underneath and, and helping them to identify what's underlying. And, you know, I think some of us adults can use some of that, too. Exactly. Absolutely. You know, I, I want to add on that, too, and stuff, because I, I remember when I was younger, and actually, I would even say maybe going up to almost 40, I was angry. I mean, I, I had a chip on my shoulder, like nothing else on this world, being a black male. There was a lot of times, even, even if it wasn't actual, the perceived slight of, uh, you know, treatment by whites, treatment in corporate America, even treatment amongst their own brothers and sisters. You know, it was just, you know, I can't tell you how many nights I used to just go to bed, just pissed off, angry, and just really to do something. So, you know, Tessie, for what you said, I think, you know, I'm glad you said it and stuff, because I, I, I believe that I would say, 80% of us feel the same way, you know, about being able to defend ourselves. Um, but just, it, it's, it's a process. And, you know, I tried the therapy once before. Um, I wouldn't hesitate to do it again if I felt like it was a need. Um, I know that, and, and just for those who are close to me, they feel like I'm more of an eternal optimist more than anything else, which was a great improvement. But there was a lot of dark days, you know, dealing with depression. There was a lot of dark days dealing with alcoholism. There was a lot of uh, dark days dealing with a lot of self-loathing. I mean, I used to not be able to look at myself in the mirror, you know, um, because I just didn't like the person that I saw in the mirror for what, what, whether I did something right, whether I did something wrong. I just didn't have that confidence. My body language was different. Um, so, I mean, I really appreciate everybody, you know, speaking up like the way that they have on this particular show because there, there are a lot of a, there's a lot of others who are still trying to figure out the jump. Where, how do you get that jump from point A to point B? There's this big gap. There's this, like this Grand Canyon of sorts between your emotions and reality. And sometimes you're trying to find a way to build that bridge to bring it together. It's very difficult. And so I'm, I'm pretty sure each of everybody that's on this panel has had those particular type of struggles. And again, I mean, if you're listening to this, whether you're listening to it live or if you're listening to it after the fact, um, you know, there's nothing wrong admitting the anger. There's nothing wrong admitting the, the, the any kind of feelings, dark feelings that are going on inside. But, you know, like um, I think Atoya said, said it, you know, what are you going to do after the symbolism is over? You know, what is what is the next steps? Um, Brandy, is, is there anything that you want to add to that before we go to the next point? Um, I mean, not a whole lot. I think everybody kind of covered it, um, you know. The reality is, I think just because we are clinicians and just because we are professionals does not, you know, protect us from feeling anger, does not protect us from sometimes feeling like we're out of control. Mm -hmm. um, and so, you know, because now personally, I know over the past few days, I have been seething with anger. Oh, yeah. um, and just trying to, to manage that myself and keep that in check um doing the things that i tell clients to do and realizing that it's not always as easy um to do the things that you tell others to do to uh, manage your anger you know um being put in the position of now feeling like the client because you're filled with so much anger um and that's the good thing though about um you know experiencing these things for yourself as you learn you're able to pass those skills on to others. Um, 
and, and you realize that we're all in this together. Um, we're a global community and that we have to, um, to learn to pass on knowledge. Um, best practices, not just uh, amongst professionals, but be best practices amongst the community. Giving information for free. Um, offering this knowledge to people simply because you want to improve this world that we're living in. And, um, and I think that's what a lot of the people on this panel do very well through um, social media, sharing experiences, sharing things, giving wisdom and knowledge. I see it all the time. These clinicians are giving this information away to the community for free. So, um, you know, I think that, you know, managing anger is, is number one right now for all of us. Absolutely. Um, I know they said that we were going to end the event at five, but uh, can you guys give us another 30 minutes? Are you guys okay with that? You, did you say 30 or three? <laughs> I, I, go. I, I can't do another 30, Terry. I'm sorry, okay. I got about 10 other things I got to do. Okay, okay, yeah, I, I got you. All right. Um, all right, so give me five more minutes then. Uh-huh. Okay. Charletta, do you have uh, anything, kind of comments or anything like that to say? Um, I just want to say that um, uh, I just want to thank everybody for taking your time out to, um, to I'm trying to fix the camera, um, for coming out. Um, it's Saturday. It's nice outside. You guys could be anywhere. You guys could be doing anything. Um, I want to say also that uh, I'm really encouraged because this is a topic that's um, very important to me because uh, it's necessary and, and um, to find other people that find it is important and you guys are professionals and you're passionate about it. Um, it means a lot to me. Um, I'm in ministry, uh, but you guys are the, the professionals at it. Um, so what makes it unique for me is that um, I can relate 100% to what you're saying about people that say, just pray it away. Um, and I think that that's a huge problem because what ends up happening is that you do have people that mean well, Mm -hmm. And you have people that are struggling mm -hmm. and they get into these situations where they have these childhood issues and they don't know how to address it because they feel like, okay, I've made this decision and I'm going to serve the Lord. And it's like, okay, but you didn't address all this other stuff that you have going on with you and they don't know what to do. But then they feel like it's a slight against what they believe in. So my mission in this is to say, it's not a slight against what you believe in. Basically, it's another tool in your toolbox to teach you how to do what it is. Just like you go to the doctor for your migraines and you go to your neurologist. This is basically another uh, step in your treatment plan to address um, another part of yourself. So I just want to say thank you. Um, thank you guys for um, being um, basically a part of this. Uh, Terrence and I have known each other uh, for a long time in the insurance industry. Um, I'm excited to help him with this. Um, this is his baby, his vision. And Terrence, I want to say I'm so proud of you because I know you've talked about this for a long time and you know you always have my support especially when you're doing something as powerful as this and um, I just want to say that uh, I'm proud of you and thank you for putting all of this together. Well, I definitely appreciate it and actually you know I'm not only um, grateful for you jumping on and helping out and stuff I definitely help uh, appreciate Butler because like I said, we've said through several other podcast episodes, we've been talking about doing something like this for over the years and just to kind of see it go is definitely amazing. And for those who are wondering, Charlotte is actually leading the second session next Saturday because she is in ministry 
and we are going to talk a lot about mental health dealing with faith. So she's going to take the reins and she's going to uh, pretty much lead that particular discussion, um, you know, from her perspective in ministry and uh, you guys' perspective from uh, faith. So um, I guess that's going to conclude it for this particular recording. And um, actually what we're going to do is that we're just going to allow, you know, I, I think that if you want to continue the discussion, if you want to, we could go ahead and stay on board. If you need to hop off, that's fine. As far as the purpose of the recording is concerned, um, this particular aspect of the podcast is going to, I'm going to hit the stop button on that. And then well, I guess you could call it a postscript. So I, I think we had a pretty good conversation. I, I can see a little bit of people commenting and chiming in. So, I mean, if you guys still want to hold on, that's fine. If not, you know, definitely appreciate it. We definitely uh, appreciate just the time that she was able to get the hour, hour and a half on there. So, um, just thank you again, everybody. This really means a lot. I mean, you guys gave a lot of excellent information. I mean, yes. just, I was taking, thank you guys. yes, excellent, excellent information. I mean, at EAP Tyler, that was really golden and stuff because I've actually had people ask me, you know, I can't, I, I don't, I can't afford therapy. I, I can't go to counseling. Um, Toy, we talked about this offline numerous times over the last couple of months. So just this conversation alone, I mean, you guys dropped some very great nuggets of information. So definitely, definitely appreciate it. So. Well, you know, acknowledge, you know, Charletta and, and, and you Terrence and uh, Mr. Butler, I think you were one of the moderators or facilitators too, for just, first of all, thank you for allowing me to be a part of it. And secondly, for picking such a, a phenomenal panel, you know, just having, you know, a, a lot of different perspectives, I think has been, I've learned some things. So I think, you know, it's, it, we're never, none of us are, are ever too seasoned to learn something. So I thank you guys for imparting knowledge on me. So thank you. Mm -hmm. This is awesome. Um, I think work yes so again um uh, this week like i said recording live on may the 9th and uh, actually my goal is prior to the second session all the panelists information in their bios um will be on my personal webpage, page drtduncan.com um and i'm doing it not i'm doing it as a service for all of us because um there's a lot of mental health issues in our community that needs to be addressed but you know it would all i would be remiss to not be able to have the information readily available um, for people to go to. So if you want to get some more information on the panelists, you're more than welcome to contact me or one of the hosts. And like I said, I'll definitely have their website up, their information up. Um, so then that way you can reach out to them. All of them have a wide amount of uh, background experience and specialties. And it was just too much to name on a live recording and stuff, but please check them out. Please, you know, um, talk to them and stuff. I mean, they're really good people that are on this podcast and we're definitely uh, appreciative of that. So um, with that said, thank you for joining the first um, live session of the podcast of Mahogany Thoughts, um, a panel discussion on mental health. And this is Dr. Duncan with uh, Terrence Butler and Charlotta Spiller. Out.